thanks. Um, it's fun to be here. Um, so I think in geometric group <coughs> theory, we enjoy, we like to talk about groups that act nicely on nice spaces, where the nice spaces are usually kind of combinatorial objects, you know, cube complexes, curve complexes, graphs, uh, things that kind of have a combinatorial flavor. I'm going to talk about groups that act on the circle, and this is not a kind of discrete object at all, except secretly it is. Um, and although I won't kind of highlight why secretly it is in my talk, um, because that involves co-cycles and things like this. Um, I do want to highlight some parallels between groups of homeomorphisms of the circle and sort of some of the other groups that we've seen so far and approaches to, to, to talking about both. Uh, so my plan is, here's the plan. Uh, in the first half, so that's this hour, I'm going to talk about some basics. Let's call them fundamentals. And I want to use these to prove a theorem. Um, that will be the end of this half of it. Um, I'm going to prove, in quotation marks, a Tietz alternative. For groups that act on the circle, or for the whole group of homeomorphisms of the circle. Okay. This, this says orientation preserving. I like oriented things. So uh, this is a group of orientation preserving homeomorphisms. No, no flips. Um, and uh, I'll say in a second what that is. And then in the next hour, I'm going to prove a theorem about a particular action of a particular group. Um, Um, about the group of automorphisms of the fundamental group of a surface. So I want G to be at least two here. So a hyperbolic surface, nice surface group. You can look at the group of all automorphisms of that group. Great, this is an object we're all good with. Oh, look, and, the, and this is even a hyperbolic group. So there's some geometry going on there. Um, so this group, being a hyperbolic group, has a boundary. Um, and the group of automorphisms acts on this boundary. Hopefully, that's something you can dig out of your mind from <coughs> last week. Uh, and what is this boundary? A it's a circle. Topologically, it doesn't have any further structure than just being a topological circle. So this action is by homeomorphisms. Okay. And so I'm going to prove a rigidity theorem about this action. It turns out. Uh, for this particular group, any action of that group on the circle is, looks like this one exactly. Okay. Uh, so that's going to be an exciting theorem and a way to teach you sort of some, some, some tools for talking about these objects uh, and hopefully relate it to things that we've thought about uh, last week. Um, the Tietz alternative, so you, many of you or some of you might know uh, what this theorem is for linear groups. Right? It says that Tietz's theorem is that if you take a finitely generated subgroup of GLN, some linear group, then there's a dichotomy. Either that group contains a non-abelian free group, or um, virtually up to finite index, it's solvable. Okay, so it sort of looks free or it looks abelian. Uh, this is, and, and so in generally we say that you know, a group G satisfies a Tietz alternative if something like this is true. Finally generated subgroups are either looking like solvable or contain free groups. This isn't quite true for groups acting on the circle generally, uh, but something very close is in, due to Margulis. Uh, so he showed that any, not even finally generated, but any subgroup of homeomorphisms of the circle um, either contains a non-abelian free group, either contains an F2, um, or the analog of being solvable or looking kind of like your abelian, or in this case, amenable. Uh, the best analog you can have here um, is that there is a measure on the circle invariant under your group. Okay, so or there is a gamma invariant probability 
measure on the circle. Okay. And this isn't a dichotomy. It's, it's possible that you could have both happening at the same time. But I'll explain sort of what all these words mean uh, when we get there. Okay. Uh, but let's start right at the beginning. How about some examples? Uh, of groups of homeomorphisms of the circle. I want to give you some examples to convince you that, that this, is a, this, this big group is a rich and interesting object. OK, um, so we saw one already, uh, odd pi 1 sigma g. Wow, that's, that's a pretty complicated group. Uh, let's maybe try and go um, for, for, for other things. Uh, how about like just the group of rotations? So I can think of the circle as like, I don't know, you know, uh, uh, unit vectors in the plane, I can rotate. Um, another thing we've already seen so far, let's see, what have we seen? Uh, last week we saw PSL2R acts on RP1 by Mobius transformations. And I mean, RP1 is just a circle. So that gives you uh, a nice action of this group on the circle. And the SO2 subgroup inside here is acting by rotations. Okay. Um, what else have we already seen? Uh, oh, this morning we saw Thompson's group. Uh, group F. This acts on the interval by piecewise linear homeomorphisms. And if I take my interval and I just glue the two sides together, I get a circle. So this acts on the circle with a fixed point. Hence. Uh, but there's even a, there's a, there's a slightly bigger Thompson's group uh, that acts on the circle. This is contained in a group. Um, uh, which is in between F and the group V advertised before. Okay. Uh, T is what happens. It's a group, subgroup generated by F acting on uh, S1, which you think of as this, this interval with the two endpoints identified. Okay. By piecewise linear, that gives you a nice linear structure. Um, by piecewise linear homeomorphisms plus now I'm going to allow you to move the <coughs> endpoint that I glued. So you can take this group to be generated by this, and there's an order to rigid rotation. Okay. So a uh, silly way to write this, if you like more, more this kind of notation, is the transformation x goes to x plus uh, a half mod 1, okay, where I think of the circle is uh, this interval mod mod 1, or r mod z, if you like. Um, and this group is uh, interesting and special because uh, we saw that this group was not simple, although its commutator subgroup is. This group is another example of a simple group. Okay. Um, good, so I've got some particular examples. Let's do a nice. Uh, a uh, very hands-on example, or a couple, um, uh, free groups fit inside of here okay. in lots of different ways. In fact, you can prove if you decide you want to challenge that the generic two, in the sense of bare even, generic two homeomorphisms of the circle generate a free group. But I want a particular example that we should hold in our minds for later. You can do this even in PSL2R, but I'm going to forget that I know anything about PSL2R. Um, I'm going to produce a uh, free group generated by two homeomorphisms, say f and g. Okay, okay. so uh, what do I want these to do? Here's my circle. I'll give some instructions to f. So I want f to be anything that takes, let's take a little interval here. and stretches it out. So I want f to, to take this interval and stretch it out to being something like this. Okay, so f of i is going to be really long like this. And so what's left over, I want it to take the complement and shrink it. 
Okay, so this interval here, I can call f of circle minus i. And g, I'm going to have to do the same thing to two other intervals. I know, maybe I'll call this j. And I'll do the same kind of stretch and shrink. Just take so your like, elastic circle and like, pull it this way and smoosh it that way. Uh, so that this interval over here is g of the complement of j. Okay. I claim that these two things generate a free group. Okay. Just as I've described them, I don't need to give you any more uh, information. And there's only one way that we really know how to prove, okay, there's only one widely applicable way that we know how to prove that things generate a free group, and this is the ping pong argument, right? So actually what I claim is that if I take a point, I don't know, say this point x, that is not in any of these colored in regions that I drew, uh, I have a, definitely I have a map that takes a point that takes a word in my free group okay, and sends this to uh, so it's some abstract word in f and g and f of inverse and g inverse. I just take that word and I apply it to my point x. That's, this is now a homeomorphism. It sends x somewhere else. Okay, I claim that this map is injective. So not only is this group free, this point has trivial stabilizer. All right. So for some of you, there's a one-line proof, or there's a one-word proof, and it's the word ping pong. And for others of you, here's how you do it. Okay. The proof is uh, by induction on word length. Okay, and I'll do the, okay, the base case, word length zero, that's trivial word, okay, I don't know. Let's do the case of word length one. I want to show that f and g and f inverse and g inverse all send x to different points. So let's check. If I apply f, uh, I'm supposed to take this guy and shrink it into there. So I would go here, somewhere in this region. If I apply g, I'm supposed to land in, uh, I'm not in j, so I'm supposed to land in that region. Okay, so that, these are different. If I apply the inverse of f, the inverse of f, what, takes this and stretches it down, so it'll send x into here. So f inverse sends x into this region, and g inverse, same kind of logic, sends it into that region. And so these regions, uh, the four of them, distinguish the image of x under words of length one. Okay. And, okay, so that's the base case. And to do this longer, you assume uh, that you sort of have this already, and I can actually take it further nested intervals, right, inside of this picture, uh, of this interval, if I, if I draw the image of these guys under f, I'll see some little sub-intervals in here. I'm supposed to take this and smoosh it, so I'll see a picture like that. And you can use these <coughs> kind of refinements, these level two, to distinguish the image of x under words of length two, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So uh, this is a great exercise to do if you haven't had to do one of these before. And uh, I'll leave it as a, a proof by audience. Okay. Um, great, so that's a nice example of how to make a free group. And actually, if you, you, know, if you, if you are an expert at this, there's, there's one thing here that people don't often uh, Notice, um, if you use this very by hand induction proof uh, to do this, you don't only recover that this is injective, you specify the, 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 or the location of these intervals, i, j, and then f of the complement, g of the complement, um, is enough to determine the cyclic order of this point x. Meaning, if I want to know if you know, some first word of x, if I start reading around to the right, do I encounter a word or a, a second word, first or second, in what order? That's recovered just from this combinatorial data. Okay, and that will come out of the proof. Okay. I mention that because that secretly lives in the proof of a theorem I'll quote later, um, but, uh, but is not necessary for, for understanding everything today. 
OK, so there's free groups. Um, maybe just one more example of very pervasive things. All right, so I went from complicated groups down to simpler ones. Let's go for maybe one of the easiest groups. How about just an infinite cyclic group? It's very easy to produce infinite cyclic groups. Um, here is one way to do it. Um, where, for example, f could be specified as follows. OK, so I take my circle. I'm going to choose some uh, closed set. OK, so it might be finite, or it might contain some intervals, or it might have a part that looks like a Cantor set, or some accumulation points. I don't care. Take any closed set. There's k. Uh, and on every complementary region, OK, so every interval in the complement, like here's an interval in the complement, OK, I can identify this interval with, you know, the real line. It's topologically the same. And under whatever identification I, I looked, I, I chose, um, I can have uh, f in these coordinates. I can make it look like uh, x goes to x plus 1, just a translation. OK, so this closed set is going to specify the set of points fixed by f. Okay. And the complementary intervals are going to be the non-fixed points. And for each of them, I have a choice of whether I thought infinity was this way or infinity was that way in the real line, which way I thought was positive or negative. And that'll determine whether f is shifting points to the right or to the left. So I could choose you know, a function, positive or negative, to choose right or left maybe positive there on this complementary interval. Maybe I wanted it to go the other way, minus. Okay. So this data is really an assignment, or a little more specific, uh, than an assignment of complementary intervals uh, to pluses or minuses, telling me the orientation of the line, which way points are moving, clockwise or anticlockwise. So what's a fancy way to write that? I don't know. Pi naught of the circle minus k, all right, point regions in the complement to uh, the set containing plus or minus. Okay. So that gives you lots and lots of choices of ways to produce homeomorphisms. All of these will be infinite order, so they'll generate a z subgroup. And the fact is that this data, the closed set and the plus or minus assignment, is a conjugacy invariant. Okay, so the pair k and this assignment, okay, up to conjugacy. So obviously I could rotate my set k and like rotate all the places I put pluses and minuses and I'd have the same kind of looking thing. I'd have a conjugate homeomorphism, okay, is a complete conjugacy invariant. So it distinguishes homeomorphisms up to conjugacy in homeomorphisms of the circle uh, if k is not empty. Okay, so, so provided you know you have some fixed points, you can always write it down using this recipe. And the recipe, uh, the topological data of this is enough to specify uh, up to conjugacy. This is why I like uh, homeomorphisms rather than diffeomorphisms. You can kind of draw a picture of them. So can you draw yeah. any homeomorphism like that? No, like here's a, here's a bad example. What if I take uh, rotations? OK, so here's a remark. Not generally. OK, for example, 
Uh, how am I supposed to draw a picture distinguishing a rotation uh, by, you know, angle pi and one of angle, I don't know, pi over 3 or something like this? Both of them are just like saying move all your points around some amount. Okay. So I don't know what to do. with, for example, rotations, non-trivial rotations, I guess. I'm, I'm sorry? Yes. Uh, does it mean that every homomorphism of R is conjugate to the translation? Yes, every, with no fixed points. Every fixed point free homeomorphism of R is conjugate to translation. I mean, that is the proof of this fact, basically. It's conjugate to translation by an orientation preserving or reversing homeomorphism. And that you can actually do by hand. You don't need a hard, a sophisticated theorem to build conjugacy. So that's a nice, didn't put it on the sheet, but that's a nice exercise to do. Okay, okay. so actually let's um, solve this problem here and try and write down something that looks like, I don't know, a conjugacy invariant that will pick out different rotations. Okay. My goal being to like come up with like a number or a something, you know, easy to write down uh, that will solve my problem. And uh, I don't have to invent this. This is secretly hidden in work that goes all the way back to Poincaré. Uh, this is Poincaré's rotation number. And it's something that will play a giant role in, in the second half of this, in hour two. Okay, so uh, let me set up some definitions. So, so what does the rotation number do? What I want to do is I want to pick a point on the circle. I have a homeomorphism. And I want to capture on average, if I, as I iterate, how far does this point go around? Okay, so you want to capture the average amount, you move around the circle uh, under iterates of f. Okay, so uh, to do that, rather than, you know, this guy doesn't have a fixed point, imagining I'm really like rotating a circle, rather than like remembering every time I crossed over and went around a time and then another time and then a third time. Uh, an efficient way to do that is to lift to the universal cover and unwind the circle. Okay, so I'm going to start by working there. Okay, so let's, let's set some notation. Uh, here's the definition slash notation. Um, if I think of my circle as r mod z, I'm going to lift it up and get all of r. But if I remembered the circle is there, right, I have this deck transformation, which is uh, translating by integers. So uh, we'll say homeo of r superscript z. OK, just like in many areas of math, you write this as the invariance. Um, this is the set of homeomorphisms of the real line. Which commuting, which commute with uh, x maps to x plus one integer translation. And hence, they commute with all translation by integer amounts. Okay. If I have something that commutes with this, well, then it defines a map on the quotient of R by this map. Right? So uh, there's a surjection from here to the homeomorphisms of R mod Z. Okay. I want everything to preserve orientation. I, I think you do automatically if you commute with this, but uh, this will make it clear. Um, which is just homeomorphisms of the circle. So this surjects. Mm -hmm. And the kernel of this map is just this translation. So this actually lies in some short exact sequence like this. Okay, where this one is generated by x goes to x plus 1. Okay. So lifting to the line uh, lets me think of elements there up here, and that counts how far I move around or how many times I've wound around. OK, okay I'm going to define the rotation number upstairs first. So for what's good notation for a, a lift, maybe with a little squiggle? For one of these homeomorphisms of the line, 
uh, we'll define the lifted rotation number of f to be, uh, what do I want? I want the average amount, it translates a point. Okay, so I'll take a point, uh, let's choose zero. That's a good point in the line. I'll take f, I'll iterate it n times, and to get an average, I'll divide by n. And I want the limit, I didn't leave myself as much space as I hoped for. I want the limit as n goes to infinity of this quantity. One of your exercises is to prove that this limit exists. And in fact, zero wasn't a special choice. I could have taken any point x, and I'd still get the same number. Okay. So this is, it's, it's uh, annoying to do on the back blackboard, but I've given it to you with some hints. This is a well-defined number. It's just some real number. Okay. That is the rotation number of f. And if I looked downstairs, everything makes sense mod z now. Mm -hmm. So for a homeomorphism of the circle, I'll say the rotation number of f is, I'll take the same kind of limit, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to choose any lift I want, apply it to any point I want, I picked zero, apply it n times divided by n, and this will give me a number, but if I took different lifts, that's like composing this with a translation by one. Okay. That will change my average uh, translation amount by one, or by two, or by whatever power I chose. So this is only well-defined mod integers. And that is the rotation number, or the lifted rotation number. So let's do a little mental check. I, I really, if I have a rotation by, I don't know, uh, maybe that one that's like x goes to x plus a half mod one, that order two rotation, hopefully I would get a half out of this. Well, let's see, let's pick the lift that's really x goes to x plus a half. If I do that n times, I'll add uh, n times a half to zero. I'll divide by n, I'll get a half. Uh, I don't even have to pass to a limit, this is great. Um, so the rotation number of a half mod z is a half, and indeed, that gets rotation number a half. So in general, the rotation number of rotations is exactly what you sh think they should be, rigid rotations. Okay. Uh, this has lots and lots and lots and lots of nice properties. So let's write some of them down to use, and again, these are things that I'm asking you as exercises to check. I'm going to clear on the definition. OK, so properties. OK, uh, so I already said that rotations, uh, or their lifts, translations, if I take any real number, this is alpha. That's pretty immediate from the definition. Um, it has a homogeneity property. Meaning that the rotation number, the lifted version of a power of f, k would be any integer, is k times the rotation number of f, okay, including for inverses. Uh, better than this, so this is a particular abelian subgroup, right? It's a subgroup generated by f, and I'm saying it looks like a homomorphism, an additive homomorphism to r on this abelian subgroup, right? Uh, this is true in general for things that commute. That's all you need to prove this. So it's a homomorphism. To a, some subgroup of real numbers as an additive group. Uh, when restricted to abelian subgroups. But not in general. All right. As you may even know from, say, multiplying matrices in PSL2R, 
you can write a product of two things with fixed points, two hyperbolic matrices. You can write a rotation, a non-trivial rotation, as a product of two hyperbolic things. The hyperbolic guys will get rotation number zero. They have fixed points. Your rotation is whatever you wanted it to be. Okay, so not, not in general. Uh, but it is generally a conjugacy invariant. Meaning that the rotation number of conjugate of f is the same as the rotation number of f. Um, and although it's not a homomorphism in general, it's up to bounded error, which is all we care about in geometric group theory, right? A uh, homomorphism. Namely, it's a what's called a quasimorphism. Okay. So what does quasimorphism mean? It means something that is bounded distance away from a homomorphism in the following sense. It satisfies that if I compare the rotation number of a product, here my product, my, my operation is like function composition, right? If I compare this to the rotation number of f and the rotation number of g, well, if it really was a homomorphism, if uh, the sum of these should be the same as that, right? So let's see what happens if I take this and I subtract off these guys. Okay. Well, the claim is that this is uniformly bounded. And in fact, in this case, uh, you can show that it's bounded by one in absolute value. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, are there any non-trivial abelian subgroups of the group of homeomorphisms? Uh, SO2. Z, Z to the N, all kinds of things that, that don't eat e within things with fixed points, right? You could think of like just some little interval of the circle. You could identify with the real line and make a group of translations. Okay, but if there are no fixed points? If there are no fixed points, then uh, there are weirder examples than things in SO2. Okay. Yeah. And I'll actually, how about I show you one uh, right now, making sure that. In a second, once I make sure I've told you all the properties I'm going to use later on. Yeah? When does equality hold? When does equality hold? Ooh, good question. Um, if f and g don't commute, typically not. Okay? But you can also construct examples where f and g don't commute and equality does hold. So, oh, sorry. When does, oh, when does equality hold? Sorry. I meant, I was answering. It, some version of this question where I thought, when, when are these, when is this zero? Do you mean when are these, when is this one or when is this zero? Ah, uh, when is this one? Yeah, when is it zero? Okay, so I answered the zero question. Uh, actually, both questions are interesting. Um, and in general, if I give you f and I give you g and I ask, and I tell you like what these are, and I'm like, what are the possible values can this guy take? That is, that is an interesting problem. And in certain cases, uh, for this particular question, there's a complete answer, um, which I can show you a picture of. There is a graph you can draw, like what are the possible values. It has this crazy self-similar fractal structure. Um, this was done algorithmically by Danny Caligari and Alden Walker. And they have a computer program that sort of answers this question in many cases. Uh, so yes, you asked actually a very subtle and interesting question. Um, what values does this take when based on what data? Okay. Um, let me take a slight detour for a minute, which might uh, help us over there. I want to talk about an example we saw later uh, uh, last week. Um, Yair Minsky had a, had a picture where he was trying to describe how you make a lamination that's not a foliation on the torus or on the punctured torus. And I'm going to be uh, just very slightly less sketchy than he was. Uh, you know, he started with, um, if I take, you want to understand a, a torus or an annulus with foliation of irrational slope. So one way to make an irrational slope foliation on a torus is I'm going to take, here's my circle, so I'm gluing these two sides together, cross interval. All right, and I'm going to mod out by an equivalence relation where I'm going to glue top and bottom of the interval 
by uh, an irrational rotation or translation. Okay. If I do that, well, that'll take this like vertical stripes under my gluing. What am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to shift them all over before I think of them being attached back down, right? So that's like, I've really identified my, taken like a slope like this and I've used this to identify my stripes. Okay, and if I sort of shear this back over to say, hey, just glue them up and down normally, uh, you'll get an irrational slope foliation of your torus. Okay, and then he's like, well, here, Instead of doing that, I want one where it's not all dense. And in fact, I only want these sort of going on a canter set of points. I'm going to like take one of these leaves that goes wrong and I'm going to thicken it up a little bit and then thicken it, but not so much over here and something like this. Um, if instead, you glue by not a rigid rotation or translation, but by some homeomorphism f that, say, has rotation number alpha, but not conjugate to a real rotation. OK, the result is that you'll produce something that has a canter set somewhere here, identified with itself by kind of a shifting over. And this picture will, will look exactly like the picture we saw before, okay. where there's stretched out and thinned out lines uh, following some canter set. Okay. So if you did the, if you got interested in his lecture and looked up Dangeois counterexample, uh, um, as was suggested then, uh, the Dangeois counterexample is exactly constructing a function uh, that satisfies this property that lets you build one of these uh, strange foliations. Okay. Um, I want to explain sort of what's actually going on there, uh, but I, I wanted it to tie it to his lecture first. Um, Okay, so to consider that maybe motivation for what's about to, what's about to come now. <coughs> mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and this is a very useful kind of dynamical trichotomy that says that pictures either look like this or look normal. So here is the theorem. Which I'll need for what I want to do next. Okay. And it says the following. If you take any group acting on the circle, so any group of homeomorphisms of the circle, then either this is an exclusive either or. Okay, one of three things can happen. Okay, one, uh, it could have like a fixed point or more generally a finite orbit. Okay, there is a finite orbit. That's one possibility. Another possibility is, I don't you have like a very rich, large group like PSL2R or something like this, um, or like a surface, co-compact surface group in there. Uh, another thing that could happen is that all orbits are dense. This also happens if your group is just like a single infinite order rotation. And the claim is, is that if neither of these two things happens, then something weird goes on. Uh, there, 
is uh, an invariant, so a gamma invariant closed subset. Um, how do I want to state this so that I don't, uh, let's give it a name, okay. It's contained in the closure of every orbit okay. and so that the restriction to K has all orbits dense. Um, all orbits on K dense in K. So that doesn't tell you very much uh, what K looks like, but I can say a lot more. K in case 3 is homeomorphic to a Cantor set. Um, and it's unique. It's the unique set with the properties listed here. Closed set contained in closure every orbit where the action has all orbits dense. This is often called the action being minimal. Sorry, yeah. There is a gamma advanced closed subset K contained in the closure of every orbit with all orbits. On K, dense in K. So, uh, well, let's say this in English words with. Uh, where the action on K is minimal. <coughs> yeah, so I get a, I can forget the rest of the circle ever existed. I now have an action on something I claim is a Cantor set. And all of the orbits uh, of this are dense. Um, no, I could make it bigger and not have something like this happen. If I took it, take a minimal such example, I'll get like a smallest possible set that satisfies these, I'll get this property. But it's not necessarily, uh, uh, for example, the whole circle is a gamma invariant closed set contained in the, oh, contained in the, ah, yeah, you're right, you're right, if I s put it this way. Uh, contained in the closure every over it. Yes, that's true, this is a constant. I didn't realize what I had wrote. You are correct. Okay. Uh, let me give you a quick proof of this because it's good to prove some things. Um, okay. Um, I, I mean, one, one way to approach this is you say, well, suppose neither of these holds and like, let's find K. Uh, but very generally, we could start right from the beginning by being like, okay, what am I aiming for? Uh, let's look at, I'm trying to understand closures of orbits, okay? So let's look at uh, the set of subsets of the circle consisting of orbit closures. Okay, so this is a set of things that look like gamma, orbit of gamma on a point, the closure of this, uh, where x is some point in the circle. Okay, this is partially ordered by inclusion. Okay, so I can take a minimal element. All right, so you show that it has the finite intersection property or whatever you want. Um, take a minimal element. Okay, under this ordering. Uh, if that's finite, you just showed that some orbit is finite. Great. Okay. So your, if your minimal element is a finite set, you get case one. If your minimal element is the whole circle, what does that mean? That means that the closure of every orbit is the whole circle, so we're in case two. Okay. And if it's not, well, um, what is a minimal element of this? Uh, 
In general, it will be some gamma invariant set because uh, orbit closures are gamma invariant. It's going to be a closed subset. Okay. And uh, I claim it will look like a Cantor set. So it's, every point should be an accumulation point. It's not finite, so it has some accumulation points. And the set of accumulation points will be invariant on your group action. Your group is acting by homeomorphisms. So uh, if I didn't uh, want this, if this didn't, if, if there were some non-accumulation points, I could throw them out and I'd get something smaller. Okay. So every point is an accumulation point. That's perfect. Uh, and the same kind of argument says it has an empty interior, otherwise I'd throw out the interior and I'd get <laughs> some smaller closed invariant under my group uh, set. Uh, so uh, the closure of an orbit in that point would be contained in it, would be smaller. So must have empty interior. All right, so these last two just come from the fact that I took a minimal element. Okay, so that says, oh, I already proved sort of my addenda that this is homeomorphic to a Cantor set. And the contained in the closure of every orbit is just because I could uh, take an intersection, right, if I had something that was, that was smaller. Okay. okay. So that was a little quick and sketchy at the end, but I promise there's nothing too complicated going on. You just check that this has the properties that you want. Is yeah. the existence of a minimal element guaranteed by compactness? Yeah, you just check the descending things. That, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Nope. Okay. You, you can do one of Yair's examples if you believe that this really works to make fat canter sets on which you do a shift kind of thing. All right, so things are pretty pathological if you don't, if you just have actions by homeomorphisms. Okay, let me in the remaining 16 minutes or so uh, tell you about what I really wanted to kind of get to, uh, this proof of the, of the, of the Tietz alternative. Yeah. Okay. So rotation number I need, maybe next time, but not right now. So I know I'm going kind of quickly. Uh, my aim is to give you a flavor for sort of how some of these kind of arguments go so that you can play with them and imitate them and sort of have a toolkit to, to play with some problems uh, in the problem session. Okay, so let's prove The most general kind of structure theorem that we have uh, for this group, this one, I have a subgroup of homeomorphisms. I want to find a free group or an invariant measure. Right? So for instance, if I was acting literally by rotations, my invariant measure would be like Lebesgue measure on the circle. That would be nice. Um, more generally, Maybe I could, uh, I won't write the Lebesgue measure one down, but if I'm in uh, case one of there, if I have a finite orbit, okay, I can just put point masses on all of those finitely many points. If my orbit has cardinality five, I'll put a point mass of one over fifth on each point. Those points will get cyclically permuted around. That will be an invariant measure under my group action. Okay, so you, you know, so I don't need it to act by literal rotations. All I need to know is that this point, these three 
Now, if these five points are always, they'll all stay in their order, right? All elements of my group permute these. Uh, I can put point masses there to produce an invariant measure. Okay, in particular, if I have a single fixed point, then uh, this Pitts alternative is very easily satisfied. It could have a billion fixed points or uncountably many. I don't care. Just put a point mass at the single fixed point. It never moves. That's an invariant measure. So we're really interested in what happens in two or three. Okay. Okay. All right, so when this kind of thing doesn't happen, I'm expecting it to look like rotations with Lebesgue measure, some version of that, or to what a, if I want to prove there's a free group, I better imitate my ping pong picture, uh, oh, which got erased, but uh, from before. Okay. So I'm looking for one or the other. Well, one thing that would put me in the invariant probability measure would be uh, if I had a group that acted by homeomorphisms where those were equicontinuous, right? If the action is by some, it's some family of homeomorphisms, these are all equicontinuous. Uh, I'll remind you what that means in a second if you forgot your analysis. Uh, then the Arzela Scully theorem means that your group is compact. Okay. And it's a fact or an exercise which you can't do, and I put on the sheet. Uh, it's a fun one. Uh, any <laughs> compact group acting on the circle uh, is conjugate to a group of rotations. So gamma is conjugate. So compact implies gamma conjugate to a subgroup of SO2. Okay. So then that conjugate of your Lebesgue measure Pulling it back under that conjugacy gives you an invariant measure for the action. Do, uh, sorry. Yes. Do we assume gamma is too close or? Nope. You're just acting by home. Yeah, uh, gamma could be countable, uncountable. Oh, maybe I want it to be countable <laughs> in what I'm thinking here. Um, no, this is fine. This is, I think, fine just in the compact open topology. Do you have a sort of a example that's bothering you? It's not just uh, right. Why do you come back? But it will be compact. Um, you mean that the oh, the closure of it should be compact? I see. Um, right. Well, wait, so, so the, if the closure of gamma is compact, then its closure is conjugate into SO2, and so gamma itself is a subgroup of SO2 being a subset of its closure. So that's good enough. Right. Then gamma, yeah, so that's fine. Then the closure of gamma is uh, relatively compact is fine, so its closure is some subgroup conjugate into SO2. I think that's, that'll do it. Thanks. Okay, so if you fail to be equicontinuous, if not, okay, so by the book definition says, what does it mean? That means that there's a bunch of intervals of length going arbitrarily small, so that elements of your group stretch them to have a big enough, to, to, have, a, to have a bounded from below length. Okay, so let me write that down. So there exists some bound, some epsilon. Uh, there exists intervals where the length of i n goes to zero, and there exists some sequence of elements of your group where the length of g n of i n is at least epsilon. Okay. All right, so this is the case that we're worried about. And we want to hopefully produce some ping pong out of this. And it's looking pretty good because I have like tiny little intervals get, get stretched. And that's what I was using in this ping pong picture, stretching and shrinking 
lengths of intervals. All right, so to make my life easier, I'm going to assume for a little bit that I don't have one of these crazy Cantor sets that seem like a pathological thing. I'm going to assume uh, that my action is minimal. All orbits are dense. Okay. Okay. And then we'll deal with what happens if not else, elsewise. So let's assume for a moment, a little bit of time, that gamma acts minimally. And what I want is to run my ping pong argument. Let's draw this picture of what I want. I want to find something like this and some f that takes this interval to like this big one, and then some g that has something like this, and it takes uh, this thing and smooshes it down, or it takes this one and stretches it over, like I had that before. And then I'll have a free group and I'll feel happy. Uh, but the problem is that this picture, the way I drew it, doesn't always happen. All right, I might have to draw a more complicated picture. All right, so here's a problem. This picture doesn't happen the way I drew it, even in like, I don't know, like SL2R acting by, uh, acting on like rays to the origin, or like the, the twofold cover of PSL2R if you like, right? If I wanted to try and do this picture in SL2R, well, the thing about SL2R is, is everything looks the same on both sides of the circle, right? Everything commutes with an order two rotation. It's like an action on lines, not the projectivized version. So I can't have something that takes this giant interval and swishes it down. Whatever I do up here, a squish, is also done down here. I'd have to have another squish. So if I wanted to do this in SL2R, uh, okay. uh, I'd have to draw the following picture. I wouldn't, you know, I'd maybe need more of these. And where my f is taking the, these two points like here and taking these two points there. And so my domains that I was stretching or squishing are no longer connected. Okay, and I would want it g to do something like this. Okay, and then I could run the same argument, but it would look different. Okay. But this is just silly. You know, what did I draw? I drew the like, two-fold cover of this picture. Okay, everything commutes with the rotation of order two in SL2R. Here's the projectivized version. It's the picture I had before. Okay, and more generally, if you have some kind of group that acts on the circle, listen, the circle happens to be a k-fold cover of itself. So I could like look at all the lifts to a k-fold cover and I'd get a more complicated looking picture. Okay. So this is just to say that um, I might have this silly issue where I should, I was, I had a kind of a complicated action. I could have just taken a quotient and then I could draw my original ping pong game from before. So this is nice picture. And this is more complicated. Okay. So I want to simplify my life right off the bat and be able to detect if secretly your whole group actually just came from one of these lifting tricks. If I could have just been like, listen, you were really acting on this circle and then you took all the lifts to this cover. Okay. All right, so the outline of the proof is to first uh, produce that covering map, if there was one, and then say, all right, uh, if I didn't have this covering map going on, then I have exactly this picture going on. I can find intervals in the configuration I wanted before from my step zero of this lecture example of a free group uh, and, and, and show that there's a, there's a free group in it. Okay. Um, and I don't have much time left in this hour, so I will maybe outline how this works. 
Um, and we can either take it up next time by request, or you can sort of fill in details as you like. OK. Uh, so let's see. If I act minimally, um, I can massage this statement into something else. So let me massage it right away. Put it right there beside to remind us. All right. So if I pass to a subsequence, uh, these GNINs, it's a sequence of intervals in the circle, they'll Hausdorff converge to some set after passing to a subsequence. So I could pass to a subsequence so that this condition uh, will say that you know all of these contain a very slightly smaller interval, maybe call that j, and then the inverse images of j under gn are getting really small. Okay, so this says that uh, there is some interval j of length. Uh, more than epsilon over 2, I can certainly guarantee, with the length of, after passing to my subsequence, gn of j, gn inverse of j, I guess, going to 0. So I have a fixed guy that gets sh shrunken. Okay. Okay, so uh, this, let's call this interval a contractible one. If my action is minimal, I can move any point to any point. Okay. So minimal implies that I could put j wherever I want it. That says that for any point in the circle, there exists some point y. Okay. So that the oriented interval between x and y is contractible in the same sense that j was. There exists a sequence of elements that shrink it to arbitrarily small length. Okay. Such that there exists some sequence h and it'll depend on x with a length of h n of this guy, x y, going to 0. I will pick out if I was secretly covered by a cover by the following function. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to define a function on my circle mm -hmm. that assigns a point x to the biggest possible y where I can do this. So the supremum proceeding clockwise around uh, the circle so that xy has this property. For example, if you're in PSL2R acting by Mobius transformations, this function happens to be the identity. If you give me a point x and you give me an arbitrarily large interval, there's some very, very, very strong hyperbolic element that takes this to being a very th as short an interval as you want. Okay. All right. And the claim is that, in general, this might not be the identity. Uh, I'll state it as a fact that you can check. This guy is a finite order rotation, or a finite order homeomorphism. And I've cooked it up so that it commutes with the action of your whole group. Okay. Meaning that phi of gx is g times phi of x. Okay. So these are easy to check from the definition. Um, it's saying, when are you in this picture instead of that picture? Here, phi is order 2. Okay. But it commutes with your group, so I might as well look downstairs. And to say that... Uh, phi is the identity map, says that at every point 
I can take as big an interval as I want. Maybe I took this really giant one here. And I can contract it to intervals as small as I wish. Okay. And similarly for one containing some point over here, or bound with a left end point like this. I can contract it as small as I wish. That is exactly what I need to make the ping pong argument work. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'll just summarize and say, so passing to a quotient phi is the identity, okay. in which case you can play the ping pong argument. Okay, um, that's a good place to stop. Perhaps that's too much. Oh, I should say, if you weren't acting minimally, then we have this Cantor set picture, and I can just pretend my Cantor set was the original circle. Right? You imagine, you know, the like Cantor staircase function that takes uh, um, uh, your interval with a Cantor set in it and collapses each complementary region to a point. This is some continuous function that makes your Cantor set disappear, right? Um, my Cantor set is invariant, so I could apply the collapsing function and I'll get a new circle on which my group acts by homeomorphisms. I can run this case, all right? Or I, either I was equicontinuous on this new circle and so I can pull back an invariant measure to my old one, or on this new circle, I could play ping pong, and uh, that must mean I contain a free group. Okay. So, in very short, uh, the fact that I'm assuming that gamma acts mi minimally is no big deal. Because my other option is this Cantor set. And I think that's a, that's a good place to end the, the, this first bit.